Welcome to part two of my IDW Transformers comics retrospective. This time, we're looking at a strange entry, Hearts of Steel. In July 2006, Infiltration number no. 6 was published, bringing to a close the first story arc of IDW's Transformers comics. Furman's next entry in the series, Stormbringer, would begin at the end of the month. However, at the start of July 2006, there was also a whole different story that launched with Transformers Evolutions number one. Evolutions was intended to be a separate line of Transformers comics that explored alternate realities, a kind of what-if premise that focused on putting the Transformers in different time periods. According to the advertisement for the title, each series under the Evolutions banner would be standalone and not part of previously established continuities. The ad also teased the Renaissance and the Roman Empire, but those never materialized. For whatever reason, Evolutions never got off the ground beyond the original four-part Hearts of Steel series. The premise for Hearts of Steel was, what if the Transformers were active on Earth during the Industrial Revolution of the 1800s? According to a blurb published in the Decepta Comments editorial section of issue number three, IDW editor Chris Ryle said writer Joe Kelly and artist Ted McKeever were originally developing the series. Then, at some point, Kelly was no longer attached to the project, and Chuck Dixon took over writing duties. Then McKeever left the book, leaving the door open for artist Guido Guidi to enter the project. Guidi had done some work with Dreamwave for the More Than Meets the Eye profile books, as well as the Armada and Energon comics, and would go on to do a good amount of interior art and covers for IDW's many Transformers comics. Guidi drew issues 1, 2, and 4 of the Hearts of Steel series, with fill-in art provided for issue 3. If you watched part 1 of this retrospective, you might remember that I said I was only going to do stories that were canon to the 2005 continuity, and if you haven't read the entire IDW run, you might be wondering why Hearts of Steel, a series that was pitched and marketed as being self-contained and free of other continuity baggage, is included in this video series. The short, spoiler-free version is that Hearts of Steel was massaged into the main IDW continuity in 2017 during Phase 3. Right now, I'll go into some more specific details just for a bit, so if for any reason you don't want it spoiled for you, I'm putting a screen up that says spoilers for Phase 3, as long as it's up. I'm talking spoilers. I'll also include it in the time code, so you can just skip ahead if you want. So anyway, the spoilery explanation that I want to touch on, because I think it provides some context for why we're talking about this series, is this. Following the Revolution event, when a bunch of Hasbro properties were pulled into a shared universe, it was revealed in the pages of the Revolutionaries Limited series that the events of Hearts of Steel actually did occur in the main timeline, not in a separate continuity. But not with the characters featured in the original miniseries. According to Revolutionaries, all of the Autobot and Decepticon characters in Hearts of Steel were actually a crew of Maximals that crashed on Earth and had their memories wiped by the artifact known as the Talisman. They were shot down by Shockwave, who gave them false memories, making them believe they were the Autobots and Decepticons, using them to run war games scenarios for data collection. The brainwashed Maximals continued their war games until their dwindling energy supplies and the harsh effects of a prehistoric ice age forced them into a hibernation state. It's possible Shockwave intended to continue studying the Maximals and the Talisman, but he became indisposed during the events of Spotlight Shockwave, and by the time he was reactivated, the Maximals, their ship, and the Talisman were all gone. And there's a lot more like where these Maximals came from, who sent them, and so on, but it gets pretty convoluted whenever Shockwave is involved, so for now, that's all you really need to know. Anyway, I think it goes without saying that none of that was even being considered in 2006. Well, not exactly, anyway. In a June 2006 interview, Dixon floated the idea that there was really no reason why Hearts of Steel couldn't fit into an established continuity as a forgotten tale or a deleted file. Roughly a decade later, John Barber, one of the architects of Phase 3 and overall IDW continuity maestro, said, hold my beer, and here we are in the odd place where Hearts of Steel was never even remotely considered part of the 2005 canon for years, 
being left out of the IDW complete collections and only making minor reappearances in crossovers of various IDW properties, but now, in retrospect, is part of the larger storyline within the main continuity. Or at least, in theory, maybe? The events of this series aren't crucial or necessary to later storylines by any means. After years of resolving continuity errors, dangling plot threads, and overall just harmonizing the entire 2005 continuity together as best he could, it almost feels like Barber was taking a victory lap, or maybe even showing off a little with this one. Not that I'm complaining, that was something I always liked about John Barber's work on Transformers, but it does make it a little weird, dropping Hearts of Steel right here in the retrospective and then completely forgetting about it for a bit. But it mirrors the historical development of the continuity, I suppose. Just know that Hearts of Steel will pop up later down the line, both in Phase 2 and Phase 3. Also, when I'm going through the synopsis and the review, I won't be considering any of the Phase 3 lore. I'll just be covering the series as it was understood prior to the later retcon. That's enough setup, so let's get into it. The story begins on a prehistoric Earth entering an ice age that threatens all life on the surface. The Autobots and Decepticons have brought their war to this planet, adopting alt modes based on animals of the time period. The cold eventually affects the combatants enough for a group of Autobots to seek a refuge underground, to power down, going into sleep mode for an extensive period of time until the ice age passes. In the 19th century, Bumblebee is awakened by a hammering sound on the ground above, wondering if the Decepticons have found them. Rather than risk mockery for being an alarmist, Bumblebee decides against waking his fellow Autobots, instead venturing out into the world himself. He discovers that things have changed dramatically and finds the source of the noise, a group of men, John Henry among them, hard at work building the Denver Cheyenne rail line. Meanwhile, Mark Twain and Jules Verne are aboard a chartered boat in the San Francisco Bay to see struggling inventor Tobias Muldoon present a ramshackle submarine. The submarine malfunctions and sinks, much to the dismay of Tobias and to the delight of those gathered on the boat. Later, Tobias is humiliated and rebuffed in front of his love interest, Kitty Merriweather, by her father and Tobias's principal investor, Stanford Merriweather. Unknown to anyone at this point, when Muldoon's failed submarine sank to the bottom of the bay, it crashed into a Cybertronian capsule, activating Skywarp, the Decepticon housed inside. At least, maybe it's Skywarp. There are coloring issues throughout this book but we'll get to that later on. Elsewhere, John Henry and his workmates discuss automation over their evening meals while Bumblebee and the newly awakened Prowl and Ratchet observe from a distance. Prowl and Ratchet worry that it's too soon for direct intervention with humanity at this stage in their technological development and that it would be best to wait another century or so. However, Bumblebee is sick of sleeping in a cave, not to mention he has taken a liking to the people he's observed, feeling that the Autobots could help humanity reach goals that are out of reach. So, he ditches Prowl and Ratchet and explores the worker's camp, adopting a locomotive alt mode when he's nearly discovered by John Henry and another worker. In this new form, Bumblebee goes about helping the workers, massively speeding up their progress, much to the chagrin of John Henry, who thinks this newfangled locomotive is a machine meant to replace human workers like himself. Bumblebee reveals his true identity to John Henry in order to reassure the man that he doesn't have hostile intentions and only wants to help. Henry respects Bumblebee's willingness to work and the two strike up a friendship while continuing to keep Bumblebee's true nature a secret from the rest of the encampment. However, Bumblebee's mysterious appearance as well as his work performance in locomotive mode attracts the attention of a man who has villain written all over him, Van Flint. Or is it Van Fleet? He's referred to as Mr. Van Flint in the second issue, then in the third and the fourth, it's Van Fleet. Anyway, Van F*** it becomes obsessed with determining the origin of what he thinks is a new type of machine and dispatches his lackey, Smythe, to uncover the information. Don't bother remembering Smythe's name, we'll never see him again. The Decepticons, meanwhile, have zeroed in on Muldoon for an alliance of their own. Bumblebee thought the Autobots should help humankind progress and develop, and this turns out to be similar to the pitch Starscream gives Tobias, promising a new age of technology logical wonder where humanity might reach the stars, the inventor really needing a win and desperate for his life and work to mean something for the human race, is swayed by the Decepticon's deception and agrees to work with the mechanical beings. But there's just one problem. They need materials, 
and for that they need cash, and Tobias Muldoon is not exactly swimming in cash, but Starscream has a solution. He dispatches Bombshell, Kickback, and Shrapnel, still referring to themselves as Insecticons, even though they now combine to form a train, to rob an army train transporting roughly a million dollars in cash and gold traveling from the Denver Mint. Kind of raises the question, if they stole all the cash, why wouldn't they just steal the materials? Oh well. After the robbery, the Decepticons and Tobias set up camp in Death Valley in order to ensure secrecy as they construct their factories, and Tobias arranges for a convoy to deliver all the necessary raw materials. However, news of the robbery and the steel monsters that committed it circulates amongst the Denver Cheyenne Rail Camp, prompting Bumblebee to return to Prowl and Ratchet, who both agree with Bumblebee's assessment that the Decepticons are active on Earth. Still, they conclude that the danger isn't severe enough to warrant reactivating Optimus Prime, instead deciding to send out Autobot hunters to locate the Decepticons and determine what they're up to. What the Decepticons are up to is preparing for a voyage east to New York. York, where they're looking to exploit the power of electricity. To do this, they're constructing a transport called the Astro Train, which does not seem to be sentient like the actual character named Astro Train and is instead just a train, I think anyway. Again, it's not clear. Starscream has one of those Saturday morning villain moments where he carefully explains all his plans and deceits, unaware that Tobias is listening nearby. The scheme culminates with the conquering of Earth and the over throw of Megatron's leadership, the prospect of which sends Muldoon packing back to San Francisco in search of help to stop the invasion he helped lay the groundwork for. Sometime later, the Decepticons are approached by Van Fleet's employer, Jacob Lee Bonaventure, a man with great wealth and little to no moral scruples who's looking to strike up a mutually beneficial partnership with the Decepticons. The pair located the Decepticons when Van Fleet was snooping around about Bumblebee, and the Pinkertons they hired pointed them in the direction of the convoy headed into the desert at the request of Muldoon. This information tips off Starscream that the Autobots are active, and he orders orders Squawk Box to contact all Decepticons to stay alert. Back in San Francisco, Tobias Muldoon is having a hard time convincing Stanford Merriweather and Mark Twain that he hasn't gone completely off his rocker and that the alien invaders are real. That is, until Ravage bursts through the Merriweather residence, having been sent to silence Tobias. The ensuing destruction causes a gas leak, which Twain exploits, blowing up Ravage with one of his cigars. Finally convinced that the inventor's story is true, True, Stanford pledges his financial aid to Tobias in stopping the Decepticon threat and pulls some strings to have the cavalry dispatched to Death Valley. They're too late, however, as they find only an empty base, prompting Muldoon, the Merryweathers, and Mark Twain to board a train in hopes of catching the Decepticons before they reach New York. Meanwhile, the Autobots, along with John Henry and his two friends from the camp, depart in the night to intercept the Astro Train. The Autobots had become aware of the details of the Decepticons' plans after inter intercepting the binary-coded report from Squawk Box to all active Decepticons. The Autobots and Muldoon's entourage join forces along the way, eventually catching up to the Decepticons, but the convoy is brought to a halt thanks to a well-timed assault from Starscream, burying Muldoon's train within a tunnel. While the other Autobots attempt to free their human allies, Bumblebee and John Henry race after the Astro Train. Having laid the rail personally, John knows it all like the back of his hand, so he knows Bumblebee just has to get far enough ahead ahead of the Decepticons so they can hit the railroad switch and put a stop to the Decepticon advance. Needless to say, Bumblebee pushes ahead into the lead, and John Henry swings his hammer, striking the switch, and sending the Astro Train and the Decepticons off the new short line of rail and into the canyon below. Van Fleet and Bonaventure, who were on the train, are definitely dead as shit now. With the Decepticon schemes derailed, the Autobots return to their cave to power down again, apparently leaving it up to John Henry and his friends to finish saving Muldoon and the others. Oh, what a bunch of jerks. So that's the story of Hearts of Steel. Let's get into some notes. The opening pages set up two factions warring on a prehistoric planet Earth, calling to mind the premise of Beast Wars, only here reimagined with a G1 aesthetic. And in a lot of ways, I wish we had gotten a full miniseries fleshing out the concept hinted at in these early pages, but what can you do? Anyway, there are also homages to early G1 lore here, with both factions deactivated for millions of years on Earth, and the Autobots specifically lying dormant within a mountain. Although the Autobots and Decepticons are separated and are revived independently of one another, 
Skywarp is the first Decepticon brought back online, much like in the G1 cartoon. Or at least I think it's supposed to be Skywarp. With the inconsistent coloring throughout this book, it's hard to say for sure. It might actually make more sense if it wasn't Skywarp, as the first thing that particular Seeker did in the cartoon was reactivate Megatron. Maybe that detail was irrelevant to the creative team here, or maybe this is just yet another instance of Starscream being colored incorrectly hard to say. I think it's safe to say Starscream would have a vested interest in making sure that Megatron was not reactivated. There are also some superficial similarities to IDW's Infiltration series, with Megatron and Optimus being kept out of the story and the focus on a lone Autobot defying the orders of his superiors to help humanity and uncover Starscream's plot for conquest. The solo Autobot in this instance is, of course, Bumblebee instead of Ratchet like an in Infiltration. Interestingly enough, Ratchet continuously has Prowl's ear in Hearts of Steel, advising him not to wake up Optimus Prime, whereas in Infiltration, it was Ratchet who believed Prime should be looped in ASAP. The Astro Train, as presented in the story, is somewhat confusing. Based on the context, this is presumably what the Decepticons focused their efforts on during their brief stay in Death Valley, but it's unclear if the engine was built from scratch or was the actual character of Astro Train modified to transport all the Decepticons. I lean towards the former, as the engine shows no signs of life or the ability to transform, plus it's always referred to as the Astro Train, often in the context of a machine or a vehicle. However, this is somewhat complicated by the standard cover to issue 4, which shows what is clearly supposed to be a robot mode for Hearts of Steel Astro Train, but we never see that in the actual story, so who knows. Near the end of the story, when the Astro Train and the Decepticons are sent plummeting off the cliff, the falling train reminds me of the Cosmic Carnival from the first page of issue number 44 of the Marvel US series. It's not a perfect recreation, but it seems similar enough to be an intentional homage. These issues contain several Transformers-related ads and previews, including a toy ad for Alternator's Optimus Prime, which transforms into a licensed Dodge Ram truck. I never had any of the toys from this era, but they look pretty cool, and I like the whole licensed alt mode thing. Hasbro was also hyping up the 20th anniversary of the 1986 Transformers animated movie at this time. So along with ads for the 20th anniversary DVD, there was also a five-page preview of a new comic adaptation in Hearts of Steel number four. This adaptation is notable not only for being the second adaptation of the movie, but also the second adaptation of the movie written by early Transformers writer Bob Budiansky. This adaptation marked the first time Budiansky had written for Transformers comics since 1989 after turning the Marvel US series over to Simon Furman. Speaking of Budiansky, issue number two contained a short three-page preview of Transformers Generations number six. Generations was one of IDW's many reprint formats, each issue containing a story from the Marvel Comics years. IDW's reprint strategy was fairly scattershot and inconsistent during this time, and Generations exemplified the approach perfectly, collecting only 12 random issues before the series was replaced by the classic Transformers series. Generations number six, previewed in Hearts of Steel, reprinted The Bridge to Nowhere, written by Budiansky, and originally published in the U.S. as issue number 18 of the Marvel series. The trade paperback features Guidi's concept designs for various characters with correct coloring to boot, including alternate designs and things that were unfortunately never seen in the actual comic. Some of these concept sketches were used for alternate covers for single issues of the miniseries, but the juiciest stuff is in the trade. That's where we get to see a glimpse of what Optimus Prime and Megatron would have looked like if they had been included in this story. We'll eventually see Optimus make an appearance during the Infestation 2 event, but Megatron never shows up. Sadly. Although Guidi produced a much more G1 faithful concept of Megatron who turned into an old pistol, it's this design where he turns into a cannon that I really love. It's just so badass. From the color scheme to the spiked wheels, it's just a shame we never got to actually see it in the comic. Moving on to the review... Look, there's no getting around it. Hearts of Steel is a mess. Bordering on being a shit show at times, though I have to admit, the book is something of a guilty pleasure. Not because I enjoy reading it necessarily but because time after time I'm amazed 
at the number of perplexing choices and errors made. Let's start with the biggest problem I have, which is the characters, specifically the Transformers. The way they speak and behave, honestly, they're all pretty much interchangeable. They have little to no personality, although I think that was an intentional choice. I think Dixon wanted to write these characters as robotically as possible because his human characters are written with fairly distinct personalities and voices. I mean, regardless of where you are on the whole rumble is blue, frenzy is red thing with rumble and frenzy, if you've got either one of those characters correctly using the word conveyance, then it seems to me that you're either completely out of the loop on how these characters are most commonly portrayed, or you're definitely making a conscious effort to do something different. Maybe Dixon was trying to homage the early issues of the Marvel comic, where the characters were much more robotic and had less flair to their personalities. I honestly don't know for sure, but I'm definitely leaning towards it being a deliberate choice, although maybe not a super popular one considering the commonly accepted practice within the franchise of ascribing varied and colorful personalities to the majority of the characters. And while we're on the subject of colorful characters, the color work in this miniseries is not great, to put it mildly. The main issue is that the colors are just really far off base from what you'd expect on specific characters. And the breakup of colors that we'd normally expect to see are in short supply. To say nothing of the consistency, which is another problem throughout. Starscream, for example, goes from being colored teal to purple to a kind of rusty orange or red color until finally assuming his iconic color scheme in issue number three. And that time that he was purple in issue two, he wasn't even supposed to be purple. They got him mixed up with Skywarp. Although Starscream eventually got to where he was supposed to be color-wise, the process seems to go in reverse for some of the Autobots. Prowl, Ratchet, and Gears are notable for being presented in their traditional color schemes at first, but then devolve into the muddy, monochromatic color palette employed throughout the book later on. Something definitely went awry in the coloring phase of this book, and it doesn't do the end product any favors. Another complaint concerning the story, I'm a little confused by how the Decepticon Human Alliance works exactly. There are parts of it that make sense to me and that I like. The Decepticons needing a human intermediary to maintain cover is an idea that works, and so is deceiving Tobias Muldoon. Then moving on to the amoral Mr. Bonaventure, that all works totally fine. I actually think those are some of the stronger story elements in the mix here, but it all just kind of falls apart for me when it seems like the Decepticons are dependent on Tobias for providing them with plans for flight-capable alt modes, which, apart from Scourge, are never actually used used in the actual comic, by the way, even though Starscream makes a big to-do about that being part of his big plan and Skywarp leading scouts to fly ahead of the Astro Train. It just leads me to the question, why would an advanced alien race of mechanical beings need someone from a species who hasn't even developed flight yet to be capable of flight? It seems like it should be the other way around. It's the same sort of deal with the whole scheme to get to New York. Why would the Decepticons need an electrical power generator? Why couldn't they just build one of their own? The idea that the Transformers aren't capable of creating their own machines to harness electricity is pretty silly, right? And there isn't really any kind of reason offered up for why. If you want to try and tell that sort of story, then sure, go for it. But maybe give us an explanation for why this race of beings, which is consistently referred to in this series as alarmingly industrious and technologically proficient, is so dependent on the primitive technology of Earth. It just doesn't make sense to me. The best thing about Hearts of Steel is, without question, the artwork. You know, provided you can look past the coloring issues. Issue 3 features fill-in art, and it's fine, quite good in spots actually, but Guido Guidi's art really steals the show here. However poorly some of the other elements might have been executed on this book, Guidi's artwork is pretty much reason enough to give Hearts of Steel a look. Guidi often gets boxed into the whole G1 cartoon retro aesthetic, something he does exceptionally well to be fair, but he's capable of so much more. Here he's given quite a bit of freedom, as well as the opportunity to get pretty creative with these characters. And despite the amount of griping I've done about the characterizations and the coloring, I do find a lot of the character designs to be truly inspired. Bumblebee is an obvious highlight, with the rivets and bolts in place of his traditional horns being a particular detail that tickles my fancy every time I see it. 
Shockwave is also brilliantly reimagined with his chain gun arm and battleship alt mode, and Scourge transforming into his G1 alt mode, just flipped upside down to form the cabin of a Zeppelin, is borderline genius and also kind of hilarious. And that's not to say that it's all great when it comes to the character design choices, of course. Take the Insecticons, for example. Now, I have nothing against how these characters look. It's more of what Guidi chose to do with them. They continuously refer to themselves as Insecticons, but they turn into a train. One single train, not separate cars. They combine together. Look, I know what I'm about to say is going to sound crazy, but bear with me here. What if your characters calling themselves the Insecticons turned into insects? It's not like 19th century Earth doesn't have grasshoppers, stag beetles, or rhinoceros beetles. I applaud trying to do something new and inventive with established characters, but this just feels like a missed opportunity on multiple levels. Like, maybe it shouldn't have even been the Insecticons who turned into the train. And look, I get it. If you want to try and reinvent classic characters and alt modes, there's only so many options to choose from. I mean, it's not as if Generation 1 already had a legacy character where three bots transformed into a singular cohesive alt mode. Oh, that's right. There was one of those. Exactly. <coughs> just seems like a missed opportunity. And that's what I keep returning to with Hearts of Steel as a whole. There's just a lot of missed opportunities and unmet potential. There are things I like about the book. The Decepticons teaming up with Muldoon and Bonaventure is cool and works well, at least on paper. The whole thing with John Henry initially feeling threatened by automation comes to a satisfying turn when he's the one to swing his hammer and help save the day. And again, there's some truly, truly awesome work by Guidi here. But when the other elements of the book aren't giving him much to work with, or worse, are actively working against him, there's only so much you can expect. Dude can't carry the whole thing by himself. I don't really know what happened here. There are plenty of examples of errors and typos in other books from this time period and even later on in the IDW run, but they're especially egregious here. At its core, Hearts of Steel is frivolous, but it was intended to be. It doesn't take itself too seriously and is more concerned with having fun. You know what? I respect that. Sometimes you don't want pathos and high drama. Sometimes you just want to see Mark Twain blow up a mechanical puma with a cigar and a gas leak. Hearts of Steel may be a silly story of little consequence, but IDW still should have put their best foot forward and applied more polish and care to the final product, as I think it would have made it a much stronger offering. And maybe history would have been more kind to it. I don't know. Anyway, that brings us to the end of part two of this retrospective. Hope you enjoyed this look at Hearts of Steel. I'd like to hear your thoughts about it, so let me know in the comments section. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. It lets you keep up to date with these videos as I make them, and it does a lot to help out the channel. And many thanks to everyone who has already subscribed, liked, and commented. I really appreciate it. Hope everybody sticks around because part three of the retrospective is going to be Stormbringer, and I'm pretty pumped to be getting to that one. So look forward to that. I've also got some other types of videos planned beyond this retrospective, but there will be more on that later. All right, take care and I'll see you next time.